So we're going to go to the host site in, um, in, well, we'll start with the one in Kingston since we already have Colin there. Um, if there are any questions or comments from there, then we'll go to the site in, um, in Mona, and then we'll go to the site in Nassau, and then we'll take questions here in Brooklyn. So we'll give the region the first opportunity to talk. Um, but I just wanted to mention that when I was thinking about Colin, Thomas, Larry, a lot of the people who are on the ground in the regions, Aaron and Dane, a lot of the other people who are in the room here, I think we have over 200 years of sexual minority activists and activism um, from the Caribbean. 200 years. 200 years, over 200 years. When I add up, you know, Colin's 20 years and Larry's 20 years and everybody. So we have really, oh sorry, that makes sense in my head. <laughs> 200 years cumulatively when we add everybody together. So what, what I was trying to say is that we have really a wealth of information and expertise and experience. And just to emphasize um, for the people who think that there is no activism in the region or that it's impossible to be someone who is not heterosexual within the region, it is possible and a lot of people are doing a lot of really amazing work. Um, so that being said, uh, and then I also want to say that anyone who's watching via Ustream can, and they have a question or a comment, they can email that to CaribbeanIRN at gmail.com and we'll try to include those comments as well. Um, we, have, we started off with our baubles, but it seems like the technology is working fairly well. So, um, shall we, and also when we go to the hubs, maybe you can tell us um, about how many people you have and how, people, how you advertise the event. That would be interesting. To, uh, to know as well. So, uh, Colin, should we go back to you and any other questions from anyone over there? So, hi, Oscar. Hi, Dave. Hi, Dave. <laughs> everybody, <laughs> Debbie, Larry, and, and Thomas, and everybody are saying hi to you. <laughs> okay, cool. So, we decided um, to be a home just to offer another option for space. Um, Serving many people, nobody responded. Colin, Colin was um, at his colloquium, which is pretty close by the office. He said that it would be better for him to come here. Um, and actually, rather than coming to you, it was because he committed to coming here. Right? <laughs> he still did this, did this stuff. Um, or we probably would have turned you guys at you. Um, my only question is what, what sort of outreach is going to be done um, to get the people that come in and other territories who would have had access to um, the daily news. So you, you've dropped out, but I think that the question was what kind of research is going to be done to perhaps get more contributions from people like Colin who might have some of the missing documentation or other documentation. And that's going to c continue to happen through the IRN. And I should say that the IRN is something that you can access without registering, but we do ask you to register because then you get to find out about events like this. Um, so we have an email list, which is very low traffic, once a month. <laughs> um, and we let people know both kind of headlines in terms of what's happening in the region, as well as events, specific events or calls for papers or so on that we are doing. Um, so we'll definitely be looking forward to getting that. 
And the more that we talk about this, the more interest that we're getting, um, not so much on people filling in the, the, the GFM archives, which we uh, hope that we will, will be able to do, and maybe someone in Toronto, um, I'm in touch with someone in Toronto who might be able to help us facilitate getting some of their materials, but also materials, as was said, from the Pink House in Curacao, and also from Caribbean Pride here in New York City, um, which facilitated the first presence of Caribbean people in the Gay and Lesbian March in Manhattan. Um, there, people are talking to us about getting their archives up online. So if you can scan it in, we can put it up. And if you can't scan it in, but you can physically get it to us, we might be able to put it up too. Um, so that's kind of the answer to that question. Um, so shall we go to Mona? Is Mona there? Mona Hub. Hi, Mona's here. Hi. Hi, Mark. Hi, uh, my name is Annika Marshall. I just wanted to congratulate you on this wonderful initiative and to ask you what the next step is in terms of what is the follow-up to um, what you're doing today. Well, the follow-up, um, the, the, the immediate follow-ups are a few things. One is that the physical archives still do not have a permanent home, and so we need to continue to have conversations and explorations about where the physical home of the archives will be. Um, as well as what I, what I was just mentioning, we're looking forward to getting materials from Colin. Anyone who's in Jamaica right now, if you have seen that box, if you've seen the materials, <laughs> um, we're happy to have those sent to us. And then trying to publicize it, uh, one of the comments, um, it's, I, I'm, I'm, I think it was in, I think it might have been in Curacao, a comment that someone made when they heard about this project was wondering whether uh, Patricia Powell's novel would have been different if she had had access to this archive. Mm -hmm. So trying to make this archive available to people so that it might affect how they think about the region, their creative work, as well as their scholarly work. Um, so please feel free to spread the word. Again, um, it's, it's freely available to anyone on the internet via Diva. And hi, Annika, I met you before. It's nice to hear from you. Thanks for that. We have another question here. Hi, good day. Good day. Uh, my name is Jeff Wentz Mentor. Is it very quick? Yes, we can hear you. Right. Hi, my name is Jeff Wentz Mentor, and I'm from a group here in Jamaica called the Pinker Fund. And what we try to do is, what we try to is document things that are happening on the ground here in Jamaica, and we try to expand the prosecution. The specific question is, how the strategic balance, how could I get some, how could we link to get some of that to all, to all persons here in Jamaica so they can see the history of the movement, where it's coming from, and the developments that have happened uh, on that on that space. Well, I, I would say that the the even the sorry the, the main address for DLOC is very easy to remember. It's just DLOC. Org. Org. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. org. Very easy to remember, and I can't remember. Dlock.org. Um, and then through that, they can search for um, the, the entire Caribbean Iron collection, and specifically the Gay Freedom Movement um, collection. So tell people that it's there, because really one of the primary motivations for us, just as Larry was talking about doing things for posterity, is that there are so many people in the region who think that um, homosexuality is something that was brought to the region, right? And that it's not indigenous, that people kind of got it from white people and British people and Canadians and so on. And this really provides that history for us. And if we don't preserve our own history, and I really encourage you to keep the Pink Report's history so that you can contribute that as well, um, then you know no one else is going to know that that history exists and some of them won't even believe that it exists in the absence of um, documentation. But certainly feel free to spread the word to um, everyone that you can think of that they can just go to dlock.org and see. So, com, sorry. It's dot com. It is dot com, sorry. Dlock.com. <laughs> and, um, and, and they can see some of that material for themselves and share it with other people as well. Can you hear me, Rosa? Yes. <coughs> this is Colin. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to 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 do that there's a critical role that um, the big report can play the other way around in making people and in making people um, 
to the archive and then being able to share that rich history with here in Jamaica. So it's actually the work that you can do as opposed to the work that we Thank you. Any other questions right now from Mona? Uh, any other questions? We can come back, but just for now. Okay, we can come back to this. Thank you. Oh, I didn't tell you that about New York. We have about 20 people here in Brooklyn, and we're in Flatbush at Brooklyn College. Oh, uh, just up at the Mark. How many people are there? Oh, videos asking how many people are, are in uh, Mona. Um, right now we have about 12 people. We have a few more, but they have to leave um, for various reasons. Great. Yeah, okay, that's great. Thanks, Mark. Thanks so much. All right, so we'll go to um, the hub that is at the hub in Nassau, <laughs> Bahamas. Hi. Hi. Good to see you. It's, it's coming up, it's a little hazy, but we can see you. There's, there's about 15 of us here. Great. Some of them are bisexuals. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, uh, I have a question. <laughs> Can you speak up a little bit, please? And so it's in good hands. 
And this is a well-established project. If you go to the home page, you can see all of the partners that DLOC has. All over the region, they have major universities, uh, University of West Indies and a number of universities in the United States who have Caribbean collections. For example, University of Florida, which has one of the largest Caribbean newspaper collections in the world, I'm pretty sure. Um, and so we have, we have, we have good, a good partnership, in other words. But Vidya might be able to speak a little bit more to that. from here in, in Brooklyn, New York right now. So, uh, any questions? And the questions don't have to be for us. They can be for Thomas and Larry or Colin as well. <laughs> yes, please. Um, I just want to thank and congratulate you I was, all. Uh, Mark, sorry, I, I oh. was just talking about Mark, we do have the <laughs> did send us some, but we may have some more. So, oh, great. Look, we have more stuff. So they're under our general collection. We also have the, the Gay Freedom Movement is a sub-collection of our general collection, so feel free to explore that as well. We have a number of documents. So we're going to take a question from Brooklyn here. So I was thanking you for this labor. This is very um, important and impressive work, and I'm so honored to actually be here this evening to to see this 
multiple technology, <laughs> different <laughs> hubs. I mean, it's just amazing, the work. But in terms of timeline, how far does it go back? To 1970? 1970. It's about 1978. 1978. Uh, so the question from folks in the region, um, well, first a comment congratulating us on this event and uh, the multiple technologies and being really excited about this, as well as to ask how the length of time. So 1978 up until, uh, is it 1984? 82, 83. Right, so that's the gay freedom movement. Our general collection has stuff from the 1990s up until now. And some even before that. So, something to check out. And we keep hearing rumors about these flyers that exist for men's parties in Barbados in the 1930s. So, if anybody's listening in Barbados and wants to scan those and get those to us, we're happy to have stuff from. Um, other countries that earlier in the century. Um, how will this collection help um, help Caribbean gays who still live in that country? Well, I think that, yes, uh, the question is how will this archives collection help uh, Caribbean gay people, LGBT folks, sexual minorities, however we want to define that, uh, in, in the region today, who are living in the region. Who now. live in their countries. Yeah. Yes, who live in their countries in the region. Uh, I think that Colin addressed that in, in, his, in his discussion a bit, as well as, uh, as, well as the, my point earlier about having these stories, as well as Rosamond, is that it allows us to have a sense of history and a sense of um, ourselves. And for folks who live in the region, having that history, knowing that there was, in fact, uh, organizing right around these issues as early as what well, we have 1960s but we also there's you know other evidence that suggests even earlier uh, that it gives a sense of one that uh, this is not something new that the struggle that folks are going through is not is not new and that there is a legacy of, of activism there's a legacy of, of lesbian, gay, and bisexual, and, and, and gender nonconforming people who have lived in a region for many, many years, okay? Uh, that, so that just gives a sense, I think, of self, and I think a lot of people have talked about this in other ways as well, folks who do organizing in the region. Uh, and, and another point, too, is that often the accusation uh, in, in terms of how homophobias are lodged at Caribbean LGBT sexual minorities is that this is some kind of foreign thing, the same hours, we don't know where it comes from, and so on. But, but we know that's obviously not the case, that there have been a history, there's been long histories and, and histories of, of lesbian, gay, bisexual, gender nonconforming, people who had different kinds of relationships and different identities around their sexuality, right? So not even just thinking about it in a lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender paradigm, right? Because those terms are not terms that, that people even today necessarily want to use. Uh, in the region and in other uh, parts of the world, right? So uh, a lot of times the LGBT movement, as we think about it, is a northern, a very much global north, located in the global north. So this archive allows us to see how complicated that was, and to see the relationships, for example, that Larry built with Americans who came to Jamaica um, and other uh, Jamaican people around the country. Uh, we talked about earlier how uh, folks who lived in the countryside were communicating with the gay freedom movement folks in the, in the city in Kingston, you know, in, in the 1970s through letters, right? Um, so this is not something that was imported, right? Uh, the, the, often the thing is like, oh, gayness. Gayness is something you can catch, or gayness is something that is, you know, that is imported. And so this actually provides evidence to the contrary, I would argue. Is, is your archive finished? Or is this an ongoing work? Um, the, the gay freedom movement, uh, as well, what we have right now, is up. All 78 documents are up and organized. As we get more, we will add to that, that express that collection. Our general collection for the Caribbean IRN is in progress. We're going to continue it as long as we can. We will continue as long as we have funding, and the relationship we've built with DLOC is a partnership, so it will continue as long as we have stuff to upload. And we've asked people who are members of the IRN to just send stuff. So people send uh, letters, people send syllabi, people send papers, people send poetry. People said newspaper articles. Uh, Lydia, our coordination consultant, is constantly keeping a record of the of the of the daily editorials that are happening across the region. 
So it's a constant art, it's a building archive, the general collection. Um, I'm wondering I think, if uh, Claude, you want to say something? Uh, yeah. And I also, before, I just would um, like to open it up to anyone else in the region if they would like to comment on how this archive might be useful to them or interesting to them. Ben, Paula, you have your hand up? Ben? I don't know, I, I, my hand was just in the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was the intention, I mean, certainly as we, as we, we came to formalize how we, how we, we see the, the transition that's not just in somebody said, like Colin said. Um, you know, it appears to have been the younger ones of us and claiming my youth here. Um, I get a sense that this didn't begin yesterday, you know, that we're part of something that certainly does have a long history. Would anyone else in the region like to comment? Uh, we'll hear another question from the bonds. Okay. Uh, some of, uh, we do have some archives, and small things, that they got in from 2001. And one of the questions I wanted to ask was, or say, some of our archives are organized around issues, or not just uh, documentation from meetings, but media to things. And was that type of collection, small collection, Acceptable. So it's not just uh, documentation from Rainbow Lines to Bombers, but it's the entire discourse in the media around these issues. Yes, absolutely. We would welcome that and want that, and that is the kind of thing that we see in the general collection now that we're building. So that would absolutely fit in our general collection, or if you wanted to do a separate, another sub-collection, we could talk about that for Rainbow Lions. And it could be a sub-collection like the Gay Freedom Movement, if that is something we wanted to do. And certainly if JFLAG wanted to also do this, I think uh, we, have, we have the capacity uh, to build and add documents. And you know, it's as simple as, well, sometimes more complicated getting a scanner, um, getting the materials and being able to upload them. But, but as long as we have, uh, have the resources and uh, the, the woman power to do it, we will do it. Hi, I was wondering if the general collection is multilingual. Hi, I was, I was interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead and then um, I'll repeat your question. Sure, sure. No, no, I just got a comment from David. He um, says his work with students and gen studies in dark from politics and university I'm very pleased with the business piece for the street of YAD festival. I just like to bring great importance of examining this thought. And he asked about the efforts of being made to contact the government that part Well, hopefully he can see that, um, or hopefully he can hear that we have uh, people from JFLAT both in the room in, in Brooklyn and um, as a JFLAT is one of the host sites in Jamaica. So we're definitely open to and interested in the um, in getting more documents from JFLAT up. We had a question here in Brooklyn asking about whether or not the, um, the collection was, multi was multilingual. Um, obviously, Jamaica is an English-speaking country, and so the materials that they produced were in English, and so the archive is in English. The project of the IRN strives to be multilingual. Um, it it's becomes an issue of both capacity and, and funding, uh, kind of human capacity and, and monetary capacity, but the project that we're doing on theorizing homophobias, for instance, we have we will have at least one piece submitted in Dutch as well as English, um, and we are hoping to have the entire thing translated into French and Spanish. We believe that we have the funds to do that. So we are striving to be multilingual. It's con con continuously a challenge, and we're definitely, unfortunately, biased um, towards English, but we are striving in that direction. Thank you for the question. Thanks. We, we got lots of patois. Yes. <laughs> yes. We have non-static everything. <laughs> I had a question about whether you, you run, have run into any issues with permissions um, for rep reproducing these. So we had another question here that was about um, permissions. And the way that we avoided the question of permissions was by not uploading personal documents from people other than Larry. So the collection has a number of personal letters 
Um, and if we were to try to get, person, to get permission to use those letters, that would entail contacting people who may or may not be alive, perhaps coming into contact with a family member who may or may not know what kind of sexual activity they participated in. And we decided to kind of avoid that completely to avoid bringing attention to someone who perhaps did not want that attention. Those materials continue to be in the physical archive, and we're still debating um, what kind, there will be some access to them. We're debating whether there'll be full access or redacted access to them, but there are some materials that we chose for um, the privacy of, of the individuals who, when they originally wrote those letters, did not intend for them to be public. We decided to continue um, in that spirit and not make them uh, public on the internet. What about things that were already published, like newspaper accounts? Or Newspaper accounts and so on. Um, the I don't think we've uploaded that many newspaper accounts in part because many of them, again, it was an issue of capacity. I only had so many hours that I could pay for the scanning. So we prioritized the materials that were created by the Jamaica Gay Freedom Movement. So again, in the archives, there are a number of articles from the Jamaica Gleaner. Those are available in, at a number of di different locations. So there's a finding aid. Um, which will eventually be online, it's not online right now. And you can see the specific articles that are in the archive, and then you could look those up on your own if you're not physically in um, Brooklyn. If you're in, in Kingston, you can look those up in Kingston or wherever. Um, there may be a couple of newspaper articles that are not easily available um, via multiple sources because the newspaper has gone out of print or so on, and those we are going to try to upload. Uh, but the the local money I get for this project done. So <laughs> right now, what's up is um, is what we have. Yeah. A question about the um, just that what you spoke about the articles, sorry, the personal items, right? Is there a way that you can is, would that be redacting it to say that um, maybe they can be published, they can be available to the public in the year twenty one hundred, but they can be uploaded now, but not available to the public until. 2100 or 2090 or something, but all those people would be dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so it's time to get it. But the DLOC would be able to then present them to. We can consider that. That's interesting. Hi, I'm Joel Simpson, president from Guyana. Um, uh, first of all, I sorry. Yeah? yeah. Sorry. Um, could you, we just missed that question. Could you just repeat? Oh, the, sorry. The question from Thomas was um, about going about scanning the documentation in, giving it to DLOC, but not having it uploaded until the year 2100 when everybody involved has passed on. <laughs> so I said that that was something that we would consider and, um, and look into. So we have a question from your um, comrade, Joel Simpson here. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm here. Um, first of all, I just wanted to congratulate the Caribbean Iron on this very exciting project. I think these digital archives are a contribution to Caribbean activism in itself, and I wanted to thank you all for that. I have a question for Thomas and Larry. One of the interesting things that this history and um, the documentation reveals is that there seems to be a point um, in, in recent decades in Jamaica when people were a lot more tolerant, uh, the environment was a lot more friendly. I just wanted your impressions about like what happened, <laughs> what changed, um, what do you think might be responsible for that? <laughs> so the question, and maybe I can ask you guys to come up so the people in the region can hear you through the mic. Um, the question was that from, um, from a, a visiting Guyanese in here in Brooklyn, um, that it seems that people may have actually been more um, accepting and welcoming previously, and the question was, what happened? So. <laughs> okay, I must beg the one. <laughs> so, okay. Um, can you see me and hear me? Yeah. Okay, thanks, Joel, for that <laughs> question, and it's good to meet you in person. I only know you on Facebook, so. <laughs> 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 Um, that question I get all the time, so guess what? I have a pat answer ready <laughs> in my back pocket. <laughs> it's not so much that people were more tolerant and accepting back then. It's that we lived in what I call gentler times, yes? Back in the 70s and even in the 80s. Um, and I attributed that to that people in a sense were less sophisticated and they were more naive in the sense that, oops, we lost something here. Anyway, we, remember we did not have uh, the internet 
very few people had um, dishes. Cable did not exist. <laughs> So even the concept of homosexuality was something that was unimaginable. So if you can't even imagine this thing, how can we even think about you know, people actually being it and doing it? So therefore, you wouldn't have any hardened position against it. But now with the proliferation of uh, mass media, where everybody knows everything and they watch every porno film available, they know exactly what goes on and who does what to whom, then they can now adopt this hardened position to say, well, okay, I'm against that, and so therefore I'm going to fight down our um, blood fire, whatever, whomever, you know, I associate that with. So this is what I see as a kind of uh, dissemination of information that has had a somewhat dampening um, effect on people's attitudes and um, approaches you know, to things that you know, they find transgressive. Yeah? I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, I wanted to ask a question, but definitely... <laughs> Sorry. I think, yeah, because the people, people can't... I have a slightly different um, answer than Larry's. Um, and that is that I think that these issues have become ideological in a way that they were not before. Um, I think some of that is about internationalism um, in some ways, but not just media exposure. I think it's that there's a crusading Christian right that has identified questions of sexuality in particular ways, but also that the ways in which we might have been different and off before have now taken on a different kind of meaning that's been fueled by modern dance hall in the ways that Reggae did not do this, that's been fueled by international Christian evangelism, that's been fueled by a lot of these polarizing ideas around meanings of gender and sexuality. Whereas before, it was just nastiness, or you know, it didn't have the same sort of giant meaning that it had, it didn't have the same stake are all the differences, perhaps. Okay, so... For example, for example, I thought it was not a very good example, but that couple in Malawi who had that little celebration that became sort of an international event. I wonder, before international conversations around this ideological idea of same-sex marriage, whether that ceremony would have had half the meaning that it took by being embedded in this broad set of meanings beyond the local. Thank you, Colin. Um, we're getting towards the end of our time, so we have two more questions here in Brooklyn. We'll take those, maybe um, we'll take both of them. I'll repeat them, we'll answer them, and then we'll take any more comments or questions from the region. So, question number one. Hi, my name is uh, Elena, and I attended the CSA conference in Curacao. That's why I'm here today. So um, I have a sense that from the presentation you guys are doing, the technology, the visual, this pan-Caribbean goal um, to the way IRM is working, to the way um, your project is working, I was wondering to what extent do you see that as a legacy you're inheriting from JFLAG, from uh, the, uh, the Jamaican gay movement? Uh, and then also, you know, thinking back to these obstacles of uh, linguistic obstacles to that pan-Caribbean project, what strategies do you see yourself inheriting from this archive? You know, what models are in this archive for how to accomplish this pan-Caribbean conversation? Um, and I guess conferencing is one thing. I'm thinking about Lhasa maybe would be your guys' next stop. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> so the first question was. Um, about, uh, was recognizing the, the pan-Caribbean intentions of the project and asking about how much of that can be considered a legacy from JFLAG, what we kind of learned from JFLAG and what our future plans are to that end. Second question. Yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, my name is Daniel. I'm from uh, Kingston, Jamaica, via NYU. And mm -hmm. I, have, I have two questions. The first is, I'm curious as to whether or not in the archive you guys uh, include responses to the, for example, to the Gay News or to the Gay Freedom Movement. I'm curious if that is included in any way. Um, so my question really is, how, how, what were the reactions at that time to it? Um, um, just in terms of thinking of context. And the second one I'd say is, um, First of all, I forgot to say congratulations. I'm, I'm really pleased to discuss this is something that I'm interested in my own work. But to also, I wanted to know if you, in the archive, if you link to kind of um, the scholarly, like what, what are queer theorists, both in the diaspora and in the Caribbean writing, if there's a link to that. Also, if there's um, any link to kind of general art. I'm thinking about novels like Michelle Cliff's work or all these yeah. people kind of think about activism that's done by queer writers, if, if it's actually included in the, in the archive itself. And just a quick response to the question that, was, that, um, that my brother here just asked. I think also one of the reasons that there's such a strong response to, um, to gayness today, I would say, in Jamaica is the fact that I feel that the progress that has been made in the rest of the globe is perceived as the, the perception, in other words, the fight against homosexuality, the perceived kind of threat of homosexuality in Jamaica, I think has been coined in this way that it's an anti-imperialist stance. For example, Bruce Golding's interview with BBC Stephen Sucker in, in a few years ago, he made this big claim that it should not be imposed, gay rights should not be imposed from the outside, that it's the most organized gay lobby coming from the north, which completely erases the activism taking place right. within the region. So yes. there's this whole perception that the stance against homophobia is an anti-imperialist one and a claim to an identity that is defined as profoundly heterosexist mm -hmm. and anti-imperialist. Um, yeah. So I want to try to summarize um, the last comment, which was um, pointing out that some of the reaction in the region to, uh, the more, to the increased visibility of homosexuality is to say that it is imperialist, it is neocolonial. Um, and, and referencing a number of politicians who have kind of made that explicitly clear, um, which have been in reference to some of the, the Saudi laws. Um, and the second question was in relationship to are there any, is there any context represented in the archive in terms of responses to or reactions to the Jamaica Daily News or the presence of the Jamaica Gay Freedom Movement in Jamaica? and whether there's any representation of scholarship and scholarly um, documents or creative documents in the archive. Uh, so I'll answer that question first. Um, there, are, there, is, there is not representation of scholarship in the archive because that's in the IRN in general. That's the whole purpose of the IRN. So we have uploaded people's, uh, when people have given us permission to, we've uploaded creative text and scholarly text directly to the IRN. I've sent syllabi to the IRN. People send reading lists, as Angelique said, people send poems, etc. So the Caribbean IRN website itself has that information. And in terms of context, I don't think we have that much, I don't think there was that much that was in um, the box that we have um, that's rel relative to that. But some, um, you want to comment? Yeah. Well, since I had the opportunity to work with the materials firsthand, I did read a couple. <laughs> I wasn't sure if I was okay to do that, but there, there was some response to the gay freedom movement itself, and a lot of people were pleased that it was just there and had the, you know, that it was there for them to, you know, ask questions about, maybe like get more information on it. Um, most of the letters that I read, the people were very secretive about it. Um, they didn't necessarily want anyone to know that they were inquiring, so they would um, send the letters from a different address or maybe just from their place of business. But the uh, overall response that I got was they were pretty like excited about it. They were happy that they had an outlet. Thank you. So the archivist was commenting that um, the, there, there are actually letters that provide some context in which people say they're so happy that um, the organization exists and that they're able to know that there are people like them in the world. And I think that there is also a little bit of context in terms of some of the newspaper articles, and particularly the Jamaica Gleaner, right, and the Jamaica Daily News that are there, in which people are just, um, because the, the, the articles are either, not all of them are responding directly to the Jamaica Gay Freedom Movement, but they're responding to the presence of homosexuality in the country. That is what we have to that extent. But again, if people have other documents, we'd be more than happy to upload it and make it a richer collection. Um, it looks as though Mona has um, a, a final question or comment. Yes? Yeah. No, no. Oh, you just popped up on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Uh, does anyone else in the region have a final question or comment? Colin, are you trying to say something? No. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron, are you trying to say something? Or is someone in the Bahamas trying to say something? Aaron, are you trying to say something? that we spent from this grant was purchasing a subscription to WebEx. So we are happy to facilitate, if anyone wants to have um, a web conference within the region involving people in different places or even in different parts of your own country that can't travel to where you are, we are happy to make this available to you as long as we um, have a subscription to it. So just let us know if you want to give a talk or have a conversation or just connect with people who are in another part of your country or another country in the Caribbean. Thank you everyone for participating. Thank you so much to the, to the host organizers in Jamaica, um, in Mona and Kingston, and also in Nassau, and to everyone in Brooklyn who came out.